So how do you face the future with integrity? To answer that question, you've got to take a step back and ask the question again, what is integrity? I mean, an e means that you're not trying to be something you're not. It means that you're not a hypocrite. It's not that you're trying to pretend. It means that simply, here's who you are, but you're also moving in the direction of truth and what ought to be. A person could say they're, they're, they're consistent with who they say they are, but if who they say they are and who they are are not the same, then there's no integrity there. Now, there's two other ways I, wanna, I want us to define integrity. Let me just give it to you. They're found in the book of James, chapter 4. As we continue this study on integrity, what we find is the book is just packed full of references to integrity. When you go to chapter 4, we're going to finish up chapter 4 this, mor this morning. James 4, verse 13. Listen to what it says. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not... And then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does You come back with is all about you doing what you can with what you got. Not trying to pretend to be something you're not, but literally he's saying, okay, here's who you are. This is who God has created you. You ought to be at least be applying that to life today. And then, and then there's one other thing here too, and that is integrity means that you don't leave God out of your plans. It's one thing to be committed to living the life that you've got with all that you've got, it's quite another thing to kind of set it aside and wish that you were somebody else. It's one thing to plan your life and to maximize your potential by actually living that way, but leave God out of your plans. That means you lack integrity. Integrity knows that God created us for himself. You realize that, right? God created you for himself. Look at the person beside you on your right. Look on that side. God created that person for himself. Now look on this way. I know you're looking at the back of their head. That's okay. God created them just for himself. Now look at me. For himself. You are uniquely created by God. You have different gifts from anybody else. You look differently than anybody else. You have different experiences than anybody else has. Why? God has put all that together. Prepared that way. But for you to launch out and try to experience God and, 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 and to do what you think God wants without including God in your plans, that means you lack integrity. Because integrity always falls back on the fact that God knows what he's doing, so I ought to keep in touch with him about what I'm doing. Integrity is all about doing what you can with what you got. Not ignoring that, not wasting that. But integrity means that you always consider God in your plans. That's why you'll notice in your note sheet there's a little box there. And I, I elaborate a little bit more there, but integrity, it says, demonstrates an informed confidence. little bit of his plan for your life today because you're not ready to hear the rest of the story there are some things that God wants to do in your life first to prepare you for his plan and so that's why you and I need to constantly be flexible we, we, we may lay out our plans and do the very best we can with our plans but understand that your plans may not have anything to do with the ultimate plan of God for your life but they may have everything to do with positioning you so you can at least look through the crack in the door where it leads God says he is God, he will always remain God, and he's not going to make you ever a God. Me either. He says, but he's, that's all right, because he's made you for himself, and you are made in the way that you can relate to him. You've been made in the image of God. No other creature in the universe 
has been created as you and I have been. It's why is that? Because God has uniquely chosen you to have a relationship with him. Now, how do you move forward? Let, let's just assume, okay, I got it. God has uniquely gifted me. God has put me through the experiences I've, I've experienced. I mean, God knows what he's doing. I'm going to quit complaining about how I, I can't do what others can do and, and, vi and vice versa. I just know I'm going to accept the fact that I'm different on purpose because of what God intended. And I'm going to accept the fact that God wants to stay very involved in my life every day of my life. With those two things in mind, then what are you supposed to do? How are you supposed to proceed? How do you go forward with integrity? Well, number one, write this down. How do you face the future with integrity? Make plans with God's purpose in mind. When you make your plans, never forget God. James 4, verse 13 again. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. What's he saying there? He's saying that he's... In the beginning and it's not everything so you you and I need to always be flexible and not just assume that now that God has opened our eyes to some of what he plans to do in our lives that that's it and you just kind of you, you just get zeroed in on that and you move in that direction not and forget that God may just want you to aim in that direction but he plans to take you another direction we're to be flexible with God it's sort of like this when an artist is painting a picture the artist takes the canvas might even balance it on an, an, an easel. And, and you paint on that canvas. Then after the artist finishes the canvas, then he looks for a frame that accentuates what's on the canvas. The canvas is the life. It's the story. It's the message. But the frame is just there to make you look at the canvas. Well, when it comes to God, the opposite is true. God provides a frame in the beginning. His frame is his plan for your life. The canvas is yours to, to draw and to paint on, which records how you actually live this life. But God says, I don't, I'm providing the frame up front in the very beginning because I don't want your canvas to go beyond the, the frame. My will for your life is perfect. It's good. And if you decide that you're going to start coloring outside the frame, you're going to miss out on God's very best for your life. But get ready, God's going to just turn you to paint in another spot. God wants you to remember. Matthew 6, 33, Jesus said, but seek first, all these other things will be added to you. I want you to notice the frame that God's put around your life, what, what he says he wants to do in you, why he's created you the way he is. And, and God wants you to know his will more than you want to know his will. So the question is, well, what is God's will? We'll do it that in a minute. In fact, I've preached a series of messages on that because the scripture is very clear about how to know God's will. But in the beginning, God just simply wants you to know that he has a perfect will for your life. And he says, and the only way you're going to live it out is if you keep your life, your canvas within the frame of his kingdom, his righteousness, his grace, his mercy. Those are things that you, God said, life is going to be implanted there in the midst of that. It helps to know what God wants to do in our lives once we've had that radical transformation. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus, right before he ascends into heaven, he says, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Here's God's plan. Again, he says, there's going to come a time when I do something so radical in your life that you won't hardly recognize yourself. God says, God says, I am offering life and it's not my will that any should perish, but that all would come to that point of change, that repentance. That's what the Bible says. But you'll not know that unless you're living your life within the context of the frame. 
If you try to color outside the frame, then you, you, try, you think that you're doing God a favor? Is that what you're doing? You can't do it better than God. God knows what the frame is like. I'll say week after week after week, you ought to spend time in God's Word. Why? So you can know what this frame is. And then when you know what the frame is, then you are free. You're totally free to literally color the whole canvas. And, and, but we usually don't if our eyes are on the outside of the frame. Number two, make plans and remain flexible. Make plans and remain flexible. Look at verse 15 of Ch James chapter 4 again. <coughs> Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. What's he referring to? He's, he's referring to somebody who feels like they know the will of God and, he's, and you're going to do it no matter what. To do for him. That's what he's referring to here. You need to give it your all, do everything in your power to, to lay out your plans. I mean, plans are a good thing because they stretch you. They, they cause you to not neglect the very gifts that God's given you. It helps you to keep on using them to the max. But God says, but don't get so rigid that you're only going to move in that direction until you finish what you see on that direction. Because God may say, stop, put the brakes on. I don't want you to get up over there. There's so much in the scripture like this. Uh, Proverbs 16, verse 1 says, mortals make elaborate plans, but God has the last word. Proverbs 16, verse 9, the mind of a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Proverbs 19, verse 21 Many plans are in a man's heart, but the counsel of the Lord will stand. You see the contrast that he keeps bringing up here? He, and then Jesus, Jesus, in exchange for his soul the soul is that which is in you when you when it comes to life that enables you to relate to this living god god says i i want you to be flexible enough right there when i, I want you to turn right over here then you're willing to say okay whatever you say you, you may have questions well god i thought we were going over here first he says well that's just to get you motivated and get you over there because ultimately i really want you over here but I don't want you to go the most direct route. I want to take you another route because there's some things I want to teach you along the way before you get there. Integrity means that you understand that about God and you want to move in that direction with God. You're not presuming that you know better than God. Moving forward with integrity says, God, I don't know what you're doing. Where do you want me to go? I'm going to go. I'm going to give it my best. But if you say slam on the brakes, or if you say turn right here, or if you say reverse, turn it in reverse, then God, I'm in. Because I trust you. Sometimes I think we trust the plan more than we do God, who develops the plan. And that frustrates us, especially if he But I want you to write this down. Number three, understand that planning ahead helps to disarm potential landmines. Planning ahead helps to disarm potential landmines. Listen to this. There's so many passages that deal with this very thing. Proverbs 21, verse 5. The plans of the diligent lead surely to advantage, but everyone who is hasty comes surely to poverty. What he's saying is don't be impulsive here. You want to be proactive. Proverbs 18, verse 9. 
He also who is slack in his work is brother to him who destroys. That's who you're related to, a destroyer when you don't make plans. Ephesians 5, verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Now, what are we talking about? And you and I, we fall into them on a regular basis. If you plan ahead, you're less likely to hit one of those mines. You'll, you'll be detoured around it if you make plans. But if you don't make any plans, you just say, I'm just going to go with the flow, and I'm going with the Spirit. I'm going to do whatever I want. And if you fall, you say, well, God must have wanted me to get hurt then. I, I don't think I'd jump to that conclusion, especially if you didn't make any plans. I, I learned this lesson uh, uh, this past summer. As you know, there were three weeks in July that Cindy and I were with our grandkids, and, you know, they're all separated, so we'd go to one family. We were there for a few days, and we went to the other family, and we were there a few days and on. And so the first family we went to that spent time with was uh, uh, the ones that live in Tampa area. The, my, our daughter and her husband, they went on a cruise, so they dropped off their three kids with us. <laughs> and, and we loved it. We were worn out afterwards, but we loved it, you know, and they were running around, you know, doing whatever. I mean, it was just, they had a lot of fun. They liked being at Saba and Namas. Uh, n- n- they get off the cruise ship and they drive to Sarasota. We give them their children. <laughs> to be with our other set of grandkids, four of them. That's the one with the twins. And so Cindy and I, we drive up there and, and they're just moving from, they're moving from, and, be, and primarily just watch the kids while they move and pack, unpack and all that stuff. I said, sure. So we get over there. And again, they, of course, and we drive their vehicle most of the time because they've got all the car seats, the four car seats in the back. And, and so we're driving them around, having a good time, and we're just getting to know them. We're chasing them. And I come back from that battered and bruised because they like to wrestle. <laughs> and so I, but I, we did that, and we did that for a week. And then we <laughs> to others of our grandkids. And so this time, I just left Cindy there and came here. <laughs> and, and then I came back for her about three days. But listen, let me tell you the lesson I learned that I kind of halfway knew, but I really didn't know, you know, it, when it comes to planning. You, know, you, you can't just put a bunch of kids in the back seat of the car and take off and do whatever you want to do and figure out where you want to go on the way. Now, Cindy and I can do that. We can hop in the car ourselves, and as we drive, we can decide where we want to go if we want to do it that way. But not with kids, because it happened with all three sets of grandkids. We, we didn't know where we were going in those, sometimes, but we would always try to make plans, especially my wife. She's the master planner. What we would do is we'd put them all in the car seats, and we'd say, we're going to go to a certain place, and it's notorious. I mean, you'd hardly go a mile when all of a sudden they start talking about how hungry they are and how tired they are and how they want out of here and they, when are we going to get there? And, and on and on and on and on. And, and it gets louder and louder. And because we say, well, we're almost there. And then, then you give them 15 more seconds and say, well, it's almost here already there. And just on and on. And, you know, it just kept getting louder and louder. And Cindy and I look at each other. And then Cindy revealed her gifts as a master planner. <laughs> she reached deep into her purse and pulled out the fun fruit snacks. <laughs> One to each of the kids. And it was a, it was a miracle. The moment they got the, the little pack, silence. Now, that happened because Cindy planned ahead. She knew. I was oblivious. I'm thinking, oh, I'll just drive them there and I'll persuade them it's good enough and we're going to have a good time and we'll, we'll play and talk and all that. No, they got tired of my talking after about a minute. They wanted the real deal. Give me some fruit snacks. And then we noticed that fruit snacks only last a little while. <laughs> and fortunately, my wife is smart enough to put other kinds of things in the purse, too, so that once you get rid of the fruit snacks, then you pull up, you know, item number two and on and on. All because of planning. If we had not planned that, we would have hit the landmine, and I would have killed myself. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you see what I'm talking about? I mean, that's... it's. It, I, I'm really talking about things that are much more serious than that. But that's how it works. When, when you plan, you're disarming potential landmines. 
When you make plans, that pothole that you would normally be oblivious to because you're too busy talking to people, you're, you're not going to fall there and break your leg. It's, is it any different than, how about you hop in the car and you, you're ready to go on vacation and you do everything. You pack your stuff, put it all there, and you get in the car. It's 5 o'clock in the morning because you want to beat all the crowd and you're driving along. And all of a sudden you hear this beep, beep. You look down and it says, you are out of fuel. At least disarm that land. That our planning disarms a landmine. Let me give you one more verse of scripture. Luke, this is Jesus speaking. Luke chapter 14, verse 28. He says, For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, The, this man began to build and was not able to finish. That's Jesus' way of saying it is. To shoot from the hip is foolishness. He says, I want that you include me in your plans. So that means you've got to saturate your mind with what God says in his word so that you're thinking God thoughts for that matter as you're laying out your best plans. Knowing that even your best plans are not as good as God's. But God for whatever reason, is allowing you to be a part of the process of laying out the plans. I mean, if I were God, I wouldn't. I wouldn't let me be involved in that because I'm going to get it wrong. But God just wants us to be involved in his life. God wants us to be intimately acquainted with him. That's a privilege. But we abuse it or take it for granted when we don't let God to be a part, a vital part of our planning. That brings me to number four. Plan ahead by answering five practical questions. Plan ahead. When you're making your plans, you ought to at least answer these five questions. They're found in verse 13. Look at verse 13, James 4, verse 13. It's interesting. He says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. In that one verse, what we have are five questions that are answered when it comes to making plans. And I put them down there in the bottom of your notes there. The first one is, when do I start? That's what he says. Today or tomorrow. You, you lay it out like that. We'll either start today or we'll start tomorrow. Depends on when we have it all ready by. When do we start? Or the next question, where do I go? He says, you're going to spend, such, spend time in such and such a city. You want to lay it out there. Where is it you're going to go with your plans? Third, how long will I do it? Here in this verse it says it's going to take a year. You're just kind of laying it out there. Would, would it be less than a year? Maybe. We won't know until we get halfway down there. But you need to ask that question. How long will it take? And then the next one, what do I do? I mean, while I'm doing all this, what am I supposed to be doing? Well, he says he's going to be buying and selling. Now, that may not be the to-do list for you, but the, but the point is you need to know what you're going to do to get to where you're going, which brings me to the last question. What is my goal or what is my objective? And his objective is to make a profit. That's what he laid it all out there. But he's just laying out there, that what do you want to accomplish? You're making plans. I like it. You can put your hands into and you can start working on it. There's things that you can do. That's, what, that's the kind of plans that he's wanting you to lay out. Implement those plans. It may be that God steps in and says, all right, I'm finished with you here. Come over here. And because you become very close to your plans, you say, finished now come with me and that's where obedience comes in that's where we have to submit ourselves back to God and say God I want to do it your way I'm in you remind yourself that life is not about the tasks life is not about the plans life is about you and him and your relationship with him we never forget that now that that brings me to number five which adds integrity to this whole planning process again and that is this integrity requires that you answer the following questions. There's three questions that you want to ask yourself after you lay out these plans to see whether or not you're staying true to the mission that God's given you for your life. How will you... That's your plans. How will those plans... God, where, where do I get that from? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. It says, For you were bought at a price... And the price was the death of Christ on the cross. 
You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. When you're born in this world, you're born with a dead spirit. Therefore, you can't relate to the living God. One of the great things about what Jesus did on the cross is when he hung there on the cross and died, he paid for your sins. And, and then he says, I offer you now life I, to your spirit. I'm going to resurrect your spirit. You're going you're to enjoy this resurrected life. He says, so I'm doing that for you. And, and then you're able to relate to him. God says, I'm causing you to come to life so you can really live. That's what he's talking about here. He's saying, I want you, I, I want you to honor me because you now can honor me. It's, it doesn't end here. Glorify God in your body, but also in your spirit. I want you to respond to my gifts. I want you to receive my gifts. Do that and honor me that way. Question number two. How will your plans enable you to serve others? How will your plans enable you to serve others? Look at Galatians 5, verse 13. It says, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love do what? Serve. Serve one another. That's part of God's plan for your life. God, when you ask yourself these questions, all the hard work that you've done, and, and it takes work, and ask and see if my plans really will help me to accomplish the bottom line from your sake. Even Jesus said, I did not come to serve, but rather, I did not come to be served, but to serve. And that was part of Jesus' plan. But we know, ultimately, God sent his son Jesus to die on that cross. He was serving us when he did that. If he had not done that, we would not have a chance. So that's what God says. Ask that question of your best laid plans. I want you to ask the question, how will your plans enable you to serve others? Then question number three. How will your plans help you to connect others to Jesus? Because this is God's plan for your life. One of my favorite verses, it's kind of one of those obscure verses, but I memorized it years ago and it just kind of, I let it just kind of go travel throughout my mind and my body and I, I, I want to get this. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9 says, God is faithful through whom you are called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The calling of God on your life, the calling of God on my life, is the word koinonia. And the word koinonia means that it's not just an acquaintance, but rather you love him. He loves you. You do things together. You are inseparable. That's what God wants. He says his calling for your life is to no longer be separated from him, but rather be reunited with him, reconnected with him. And you do that by faith. You simply open up yourself and say, I don't deserve access to you, but you offer it to me by, freely with your grace. I don't deserve a second chance, but you're offering me a second chance because of what you, Jesus, did on that cross for me. You died for my sins. And now, Jesus, you're alive. You rose again from the dead, and you're offering me a resurrected life. You're saying that if I respond to you just in faith, you say there's nothing I can do to get it. All I have to do is just place my faith in you that you cause my spirit to come to life on the inside of me and I can now intimately know you. Yes, that's it. See, you want to ask that question. Does God's plan for your life include you sharing that, that good news? The God and your plans, they're not God's. God's going to use you in your profession, in your career. He's going to use you at the school that you go to. He's going to use you in your neighborhood for that very reason. That's why you're all different. Because it takes the difference in you to be able to relate to those people who have not yet, by faith, received Christ. You are a Christian if you have simply exercised your faith in Jesus Christ and said, I believe you died for me. I believe you me life if I just receive it by faith. Once you do that, and receive his gift, done. You're transformed. If you've never done that, that's what you're lacking. A Christian is not somebody who's somehow fixed 
their, the problems of their life. It's not just somebody who has somehow learned to live differently. A Christian is simply somebody who's taken God up on his word and said, you offer that to me free, I accept your free gift right now. And it's done. Well, it's hard to live a life that passes that on unless you've already received it yourself. And that's why I'm sharing this with you now. You need to receive his gift before you can. Because the obvious answer to that question is if, if you've never received him by faith yourself, you can't pass that on to somebody else. You don't know. They're going to have doubts. They're going to question you. You're not going to have the answers. But give your life to Christ, and you still won't have all the answers, but you'll know and you'll have the confidence that you are no longer the same person you used to be. You're transformed. Now that brings me to number six. Refuse to procrastinate and start today. Do we have any procrastinators in this crowd here today? Go ahead. This is confession time. All right. There are many. There are many. This is really important. Two specific things to say to you. And they're part of your notes there. Number one, tomorrow is certain. I know what you're thinking. Procrastinators are saying, I'm just waiting for a better day, better timing. I'm, I'm waiting until it's, it's, it's a perfect situation. That's never going to happen. Verse 14. Tomorrow, for what is your life? It's a, even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills. What he's saying is, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, so don't talk like you can waste today at the expense of tomorrow. There's more. Proverbs 27.1. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day will, may bring forth. It's, again, he's saying, don't put your life on hold until tomorrow because when you get to tomorrow, tomorrow's going to look a lot like today. Proverbs 3, verse 27. Or no, let's go back to Matthew. I want to show you a New Testament passage. Matthew chapter 6, verse 34. So do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Wouldn't you agree? Proverbs 3, 27. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in the power of your hand to do so. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come back tomorrow, uh, come back and tomorrow I'll give it when you have it with you today. But that's what we do. We put it off. We procrastinate. God says, you, tomorrow's not going to be any different. And let me give you the second statement to those of you who are procrastinators. You can only live one day at a time. You can only live one day at a time. You are given this day. And that's why you need to get started on the plan today. You may not be able to accomplish the whole thing today, but you at least need to move in that direction. Psalm 39, verse 4 says, Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered and that my life is fleeing away. Cry out to God and let him know. He'll remind you. He'll set the alarm. Psalm 144, verse 4. Man is like a mere breath. His days are like a passing shadow. <clears throat> One of my favorite authors is John Grisham. He's written all these books on law and it's a kind of mysteries. And, and, and he, he became very popular, I guess, in the 90s. He went to law school. And after law school, he established his own firm. And then he was kind of in the back of his mind wanted to do some writing. He became a bestseller uh, for the longest time. And when he did all that, he had a good friend at law school with him that they had dreams together. They were going to do things together. And his good friend called him. He's about 28, 29 years old at the time. He calls John Grisham in and he says, I, I've got something I need to tell you. He says, I've just been diagnosed with cancer and they're giving me less than four months to live. And John Grisham, you know, shocked. This is his best friend. The guy that he's done life with. And, uh, of course, and what are you supposed to do? And John Grisham asks him this question. What do you do when you realize you're about to die? And here's the guy, his friend's answer. It's really simple. You get things right with God, and you spend as much time with those you love as you can. Then you settle up with everybody else. And then he paused for a moment, and then he said these final words. You know, 
really you ought to live every day like you have only a few days to live. And John Grisham, when he was interviewed, he says, he, John Grisham, inspiration. And it wasn't even to write. He just liked to write, so he wrote it. It was very good stuff, and people bought it. But that was not what he really wanted to be known for. You know what he really wanted to do? He wanted to coach Little League Baseball. And he wanted to lead mission trips from his local church on a regular basis. And that's what he did. He quit his law firm. And he started taking all these mission trips with his church and, and bringing the people with him. And he started immediately to coach Little League Baseball because he wanted to influence those kids as they were growing and teach them the things of God. Strong believer. He, but it, was a wake, it took a wake-up call from his friend to get him to go down that road. Let me give you one last thing. How do you face the future with integrity? Keep reminding yourself what is really important. I mean, that's really the bottom line. Keep reminding yourself what's really important. He, G, James sums it up in verse 17. No. So what? Know what is good. How are you going to know what's good? By spending time in God's Word. Second, do what is right. That's where integrity comes in. You do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, not because it benefits you, but because it's the right thing to do. So do what is right. That will always involve service. And then third, he's saying trust God to always provide what you need to do the right thing. When God requires of you something, just know He will resource it. This quote that I want to give you by a guy named W. M. Lewis. And he says, The tragedy of life is not that it ends so soon, but that we wait so long to begin it. This is your moment, folks. You want to live life with integrity? You start now. This moment. You're not going to get it all done because some of you are going to live longer than others. But the problem is we don't know how long we have. But we do know we have today. And we do know that we have the ability to make plans to move us into day two. If day two doesn't come, you go with plan B. But if day two comes, is good news in his life. You are not the way you are. He knows it's going to require you being the way you are to accomplish his plan. So the question is, are you willing? Please say yes to God. And you start by simply receiving his gift. If you've not received his gift of life, the one that forgives you of sin, the one that entails his dying on the cross, if you've not done that, then tell him, I believe you did that for me, and I accept your gift. At that moment, you are immediately forgiven, immediately changed. The Bible says, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things are gone. Behold, new things have come. That's what happens the moment you accept his gift. Please do that now so that you can pass it on to others. Your life was meant to influence others for good the best good you could give to somebody would be the good news of Jesus Christ. Let's stand together quietly as I lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and how you use it to get us, to stir us up, to wake us up. Lord, we don't want to waste this moment. We want to live it the way you prescribed it. So Father, help us to take the next step of integrity. Please, Lord, I lift up those who have not yet taken you up on your offer of forgiveness in life. Help them to, to believe today so that they walk out of this place forgiven and changed. Lord, I lift them up to you right now. Please change them as they turn their heart to you. Now, as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, please, this is a time... 
here at the front, willing to answer questions, to pray with you, just encourage you. We're here. If you just want to talk with somebody, just come on. We're not going to force you to do anything. But if you're ready to, to trust Christ, if you're ready to receive him, then this is a good way to do that. You just come on down. Suzette's going to play. She's going to sing. You come on right now. Come on. You are so, so good to us. Thank you. We trust you. We're going to follow. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now listen, gang, before we dismiss, uh, we need to pray for a group of people that are getting ready to go on mission. Uh, we've got an entire team of people going up to Quebec City uh, this week. Quebec City is the least evangelized city in North America. And we've, and we've been working with this church that got started there a couple years ago, and we're seeing lots of fruit there. So we have a whole team that's going to be going up there to come alongside that church. Then we also have a young lady who's a part of our church, Annalise Hardman. She's here somewhere. And I want you all to come on up here right now. Annalise is going to Cambodia for a year, and she's going to be working with house churches there as well as she's going to be working at the, it's sort of like a Holocaust museum. So come on up here, Annalise and, and the team. Come on.